In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. It seems nearly every week for the past several months, going back to the time of our parking lot masses, seems nearly every week I get a phone call from the bishop's office, otherwise known as the chancery calling me about some complaint that has been made, often by a neighbor or sometimes by um, some spy who has come here from outside our parish or simply some crank. It's, it's never from you, the faithful. Typically an anonymous call or some posting on social media complaining about either something I've said or something we're doing or something we're not doing. So this is, goes on week after week and month after month. This past week, I had another call from the Chancery Tuesday morning. And so frequent are these calls that uh, when I see it on caller ID now, instead of saying hello, I say, now what? Because I know who it is. So I answered the phone this week, now what? The voice at the other end said, this is the chance we're just calling to wish you good morning. You know, we wanted you to have one week where there wasn't some complaint against you. So I'll grant them that. That leads into my next point. In the gospel text of this Mass, we have one of many, many parables that are recorded in the Gospels. And our Lord taught in parables for a number of reasons, but one of which was to make it harder for his enemies to have evidence and to conspire against him. He did not fear his enemies. He just knew the timing and the manner in which he was to die and he was not going to give them any unnecessary evidence to try to bring him down earlier. In fact, St. Mark records that as the enemies rose, our Lord spoke almost exclusively in parables. So I just want to say I plan to follow the Lord's example in sometimes speak somewhat cryptically or in parables, not because I fear our enemies, and they are many, um, but just to make it harder for them to make their case and try and stop the good that is happening. Now, I want to relate about a half dozen activities of those whom I have described as the children of darkness. The children of darkness are those who are not allied with our Lord. Quite the opposite, whether knowingly or not, they are allied with the prince of this world, the prince of darkness. And they have been very active especially in the past couple of weeks, even less than two weeks, the, the past 10 days or so. What are some of the wicked deeds of these children of darkness? Well, among other things, on the tragic anniversary of the legalization of abortion, going back some 48 years, marking a day in which more than 60 million unborn children have been mercilessly murdered by abortion, the children of darkness were celebrating and they issued a proclamation and made a promise that they would do whatever they could by federal law to impede or stop anything that might impede access to abortion. 
What else did the children of darkness do? They are now releasing federal tax dollars, our money, not only to the abortion industry in our nation, but abortion even outside of our own borders. Our money to murder children outside our own borders. The children of darkness have also attempted to break down the natural boundaries intended and created by God between the two sexes, male and female. That's how the Bible begins, describing that God created in his image male and female. And every act of creation since is an act of creating a person, male or female. And we don't have a choice in that matter. And we don't have the right to change or attempt to change what God has created. But the children of darkness don't see it that way. So they have broken down boundaries, protective boundaries, in the matter of activities and locker rooms and bathrooms that are rightly segregated between the sexes so that perverts and predators can now access children and teens in bathrooms and locker rooms. Children of darkness have also declared that, once again, our military ranks will be infiltrated with individuals who are so psychologically or morally twisted that they already have changed or intend to change their sex. And furthermore, for military members who choose while in service, Taxpayer dollars will pay for surgery to mutilate men and women to try to become the opposite sex. Finally, the children of darkness are attacking my pillow. I don't mean my personal pillow, my pillow on my bed in my rectory. I mean my pillow. Is there a Minnesotan who doesn't know my pillow? Maybe if you've never watched television. But my pillow is a Minnesota based company that's very successful. And the children of darkness are boycotting and attempting to destroy that company because its founder and CEO identifies himself as Christian pro-life, and pro-Trump. And my friends, I assure you that if the children of darkness will go after my pillow, soon enough they will go after our church. That is assured. Now, I recount just some of the wicked deeds of the children of darkness of the past two weeks or so, because it is important that the light of Christ expose these wicked deeds of murder and perversion, among other things, and that the children of light be aware of them and, of course, reject them and their ways. And God, in his time and manner, will destroy their wicked deeds, and if they fail to repent, that is, the children of darkness, they themselves will be destroyed eternally. Now, in our epistle from St. Paul, the apostle used uh, not what we would call a parable, but an image from the secular world, the image of a race, probably had in mind the Olympian races. Uh, the Jews did not even participate in secular sports for various reasons, but St. Paul draws upon this image and describes our life as Christians 
is like running a race. And he speaks of it in terms of only one wins the crown, so we should run the race to win the crown. But of course, he knows and we know that the race that we're in is not a competition against each other. There's, there's not going to be only one person necessarily in this entire congregation that will achieve the crown of salvation. We're not in competition with each other. It's more we're in competition with ourselves. Will we continue in the race? The race is not a sprint. We don't get to sprint in the footsteps of Christ for a short time and then do what we want and win the crown. It's a marathon. It's a very, very long marathon. And what's particularly hard is we don't even know how long the marathon is. Is our personal marathon for another year or 10 or 20? We don't know. God knows. But it's a marathon. And we have to have steadfastness and endurance, perseverance, and faith for the duration. And there are many obstacles along the way. The children of darkness will attempt to do what they can to trip us up along the way and lead us down other paths that don't lead to the goal. We need to be aware of it. But all the more with the intensified activity of the demonic world in the present, with the increased activity of the children of darkness, with the institutional weakness of the church, it makes it all the more difficult right now to stay in the race. But run we must. We're in a long marathon. So now more than ever, how important it is that we continue to remain in the light of Christ, to illumine our minds, to recognize evil for what it is, and to know what to do in each situation and to remain in the grace of Christ, which is our strength, which will allow us to continue in our race, our marathon, until God willing, we achieve the goal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.